Hi, hello. Welcome to the sixth um, panel, panel six. Um, this is slightly different than the other panels and that we are live. You'll get to hear us, uh, or the panelists will speak live to you. Um, and then there'll be a, a, a opportunity for questions as you've seen with the other panelists. And so uh, the topic is putting compassion into action. Um, and you see all our speakers today are from Nantian Institute. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ian Sinclair, who is a lecturer and researcher uh, at Nantian Institute and an honorary research fellow at the University of Queensland School of Historic and Philosoph Philosophical Inquiry. And today he's going to talk to us about worldly altruism versus mega compassion, divergent ideals of benevolence and their implications. So Ian, um, please continue. And in this presentation, I'll be taking a more systemic look at compassion. And here I've decided to look at two contrasting attitudes to compassion, which I call worldly altruism on the one hand uh, and mega compassion on the other. So as I was starting my presentation, I was thinking, gee, it'd be nice if the slides could almost speak for themselves. Uh, but of course, we can't get away with that in this symposium. Uh, in any case, this is a visual heuristic for what I mean by the difference between worldly altruism and mega compassion. On the one hand, we have cannibalization, the ecosphere for human gratification. Worldly altruism is usually uh, anthropocentric. It puts the human at the center of the universe and the rest of the universe is dispensable and consumable for human gratification. On the left, we have mega compassion. The ecosphere is a site of all forms of transmigrating conscious life. Mega compassion asks you to think about the possibility that your consciousness could be embodied in another life form. It could have been in a different kind of body in the past, or it could be in the future. Throughout the symposium, we have heard quite a few presenters talk about compassion, yet we haven't had a definition of compassion that maybe we could all grasp. So pardon me for giving you this slide again. Uh, I think I'll just go through it quickly. Compassion is the wish to relieve the felt suffering of others. Uh, a wish is a, a volitional act. Compassion can't be forced. Uh, the, the idea that you'll be forced to, to love someone or something is not part of, of the, the, the mental process of compassion. Compassion involves action. Uh, this is also uh, stated by Lou Lancaster at the very beginning of the symposium. Compassion means wanting to do something. Uh, it goes beyond empathy and asks you to, to do something, usually to give something up. Compassion is also consciously experienced. It's part of uh, our subjective understanding of the world. And it's, it's part of, uh, it can be in some ways mapped to neural correlates. Uh, there's an article on this uh, book chapter rather, published in 20, uh, 2018 by Stevens and Benjamin, the brain that longs to care for others. So compassion now uh, has, uh, we can see it if you like on, on scans. Uh, a corollary here is that compassion is not felt by things that don't feel. Uh, society is an unfeeling entity, an organization is just a, an, an abstract, an abstraction. Uh, a government is, is also just a, a structure. These things don't feel. Uh, so when we talk about compassionate societies or, or whatever, uh, we have to understand that at the end of the day, compassion is uh, a volitional state, okay? Compassion boils down to individual conscious beings feeling uh, the need to, to act, to benefit each other, okay? So in, perhaps we should talk instead about compassion conducive systems rather than ideologies, okay? It's, we can get caught up in ideologies, but at the end of the day, it's down to us. Now, worldly altruism is not my term. 
Uh, it's on the other hand, it's not a particularly common term in the discourse on on Buddhism and how Buddhism should be engaged. Let's say in humanistic Buddhism, uh, it it was originally put around in I think by some uh, thinkers in the in the Catholic world by some theologians. But now we have Buddhists thinking about worldly altruism and the limits of development ideology and so on. Uh, since the beginnings of all our lifetimes, all sentient beings have been our mothers. So worldly altruism with its relative framework doesn't have the force or strength of the practice of Dharma and cannot save beings from suffering in any permanent sense. Now, some of what we heard about compassion uh, really limits the practice of compassion to this life. Whereas in Buddhism, compassion is generally understand in the context of uh, trans individual existence and in the realm of rebirth and so on. One of the characteristic features of worldly altruism is growthism. This is an economic paradigm in which economic output always grows and I suppose the altruistic idea here is that if the economy grows, everyone benefits. Okay, sure, so the rich benefit more than everyone, but then we get the, the trickle down. So growthism, however, involves generational theft. Uh, we live on a finite planet. We, we don't live in a, a boundless realm. And in order to achieve uh, benefits in this world, in this life, we usually need to borrow from the future. Even if growthism works, it leads to overpopulation. Uh, is, is overpopulation an outcome that's uh, altruistic? Uh, we don't hear much about overpopulation because it's part of the taboo that's uh, attached with, with worldly altruistic growthism. So uh, on the other hand, we have to face the fact that uh, you know, even if we realize a, a lot of benefit, a lot of uh, economic benefit, we may end up uh, uh, achieving populate, a population crash. The main critique of growthism from within the world, the altruism sphere uh, is from Daly, who used to work from the World Bank. This is it in a nutshell. Growth in a finite and entropic world now produces ilf, faster than wealth. Okay, well, growth involves depletion. Uh, entropy means that, that the total order in the system always decreases and growthism is always borrowing from the future. Uh, yet before daily, we had lots of critiques of growthism from within the global south and the Buddhist world. We had Tagore, Kumaraswamy, and of course, Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful. Another, um, Accompaniment of growthism is technopression. Uh, now we're coming into the idea that the, the world is, is getting such a hard place to live in that we just want to escape. We want to uh, you know, divert our attention uh, away from what we see before us, the, the reality of, of suffering in this world and just put on the headset and you know, watch some ads and you know, keep, keep the growthist economy moving. So uh, technopression is just a, a new means to accelerate growthism. And this is, uh, you know, it's, it somehow ties itself to, to altruism. The technology is there, we have to use it. You know, there's gotta be some good in it. Let's not think too much about the consequences. Uh, and then finally, alongside growthism, we have the discourse of sci-fi. Okay, we can just, uh, once the world, you know, starts to, to cave in on itself, we can just go and uh, jump in our rocket and, and go somewhere else. But uh, we can't, no one has managed to do this. Uh, it, you know, we don't know how to terraform Mars. We don't know, we don't have the faintest idea how we're going to fix up another planet in a few decades when we can't fix this one over which we have more control over than ever in the same time span. Okay, so I think uh, en enough on the critique of worldly altruism. Let's look now at mega compassion. Uh, this is a, 
Neologism, you might not have heard it before. What it just means though, is great compassion. This is a term of Buddhist discourse, corresponds to the Sanskrit word karuna, maha karuna, uh, in which the word maha just means mega, it's the same cognate, right? Uh, what's different about mega compassion? It aims to relieve the suffering of all others, okay? That's everything. So that's all sentient beings, that's all types of sentient being, everything that's got sentience. So we believe that the COVID-19 virus probably doesn't have sentience, but uh, almost everything up from that will. We want to save sentient beings in all places, that's across the whole of the ecosphere, uh, across all of, of the sentient domain, and across, this is critical now, all times, okay? So we want to save all the beings in the future, not just in the present generation. Uh, and what mega compassion specifically does not involve is being compassionate towards your kin and your mates and your pals. Uh, we, we just expect that you're gonna be compassionate towards you know, your family members or your, you know, your preferred in-group. You know, that'd be pretty strange if you weren't. Uh, in, in a way, there's no volition there. It's just expected. Uh, whereas mega compassion is the opposite. It invites you to, to feel uh, sympathy and to act on the behalf of people you have nothing to do with. And of course, uh, animals and uh, all sentient life. Traditionally, mega compassion is part of the Bodhisattva vow which begins in one of its main formulations, as long as cyclic existence without end, for that long, I of limitless practice shall act for the benefit of beings. Now, for those of us who are not familiar with the Mahayana and the way of the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva is the Buddha to be, who in every lifetime does something generous, does something compassionate uh, for the benefit of beings. Okay, this is not self-interest. This is all designed to propel to enlightenment over lifetime after lifetime. So here, of course, we have an appeal to, uh, let's say some kind of post-mortem continuity. This is a religious ideal, although as many of us here may know, there are increasingly secular understandings of transmigration rebirth. Uh, Professor Lancaster said in a seminar last week that rebirth or uh, transmigration could simply be the continuity of information, for example. So on the whole, though, this is a, a religious practice and it's a very, very tough one. It's, uh, it's a binding commitment on your future birth. Okay, I, I don't, you know, it's tough to get into a contract in this life, but to uh, get into one in the next life is quite an undertaking. Okay, so just a few more slides now. <sighs> Yesterday, uh, Will Tillard Douglas talked about the exchange of self and others. Uh, there's quite a lot to say uh, in addition to what Will said, starting with the fact that this practice uh, is not limited to people of a certain uh, neural configuration. It's for everyone following the Bodhisattva path. But also that practice, the exchange of self and others could be limited by the context of, of the Bodhicharya Avatara and Shanti Deva, whom Will was talking about, which is tantric. The Bodhicharya Avatara seems to be very much tied to tantric practice, and that might mean that it is restricted in some way. However, what I'd like to do very quickly now uh, in the next minute or two is talk about a practice that has come to light very recently just in the past couple of years. Uh, a Sanskrit text has popped up in the Tibet Autonomous region of China, uh, and it contains a description of how to practice great compassion by a 10th and 11th century Indian master called Ratnakara Shanti. Uh, and he wrote a text called The Cultivation Process of the Perfection of Wisdom. And I'll just quickly go through this now. It's just uh, one sentence. Uh, and it offers an idea of how we can put compassion into practice or great compassion specifically 
even if we may not be able to sign up to the Bodhisattva ideal. So first of all, we sit down on a comfortable seat in a private place, agreeable to mind. So we need all those things together. Uh, you know, going out and, and sitting out in public may not be conducive to meditation uh, and so on. This is really just boilerplate of late Buddhist meditation procedure. Then having contemplated a suffering, suffering being of the six transmigratory realms. So when you sit down to meditate, you think of a suffering sentient being, a suffering person, suffering animal or bird, or you know, uh, some kind of a sentient life. Here, the six realms stands for the whole of transmigratory experience. So it's really the same as saying all beings. Then you should raise the bodhicitta. Uh, we'll hear Jane talk about bodhicitta in her talk. That's the, the thought of becoming enlightened. That's the, the wish to become enlightened that uh, motivates you, uh, accompanied by mega compassion. Okay, bodhicitta needs compassion uh, in this practice. Okay, so this is just a, a quick example of how you can visualize, let's say, the ecosphere, starting with someone or something or some, some living creature that happens to be uh, suffering at that moment. Okay, just quickly, in conclusion, worldly altruism has narrow, narrow temporal horizons. Uh, it's always anthropocentric and entails growthism. As a result, it's counterproductive. And of course, there is no ideal of transcendence in worldly altruism. You know, you just get your stuff and you know, you live a slightly more economically comfortable life and that's it. Then we look quickly at great compassion. Uh, great compassion is explicitly tied to transcendence, but it's normative practice. That is the thing you usually do entails strong belief about post-mortem survival. So in order to cultivate great compassion, you, you have to have the awareness that uh, acting on your great compassion will, will may, may not realize any benefits for you, at least in this lifetime. Then we uh, had a quick look at one way we could turn great compassion into a regular practice. It can still be realized uh, outside, uh, let's say an environment of strong belief, and that's one way we can do great compassion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ian. That was uh, well worth waiting for your audio to come through there. That that was uh, <laughs> very interesting and challenging, certainly to me uh, personally. So we'll move on now to uh, Jane, Jane Wang, uh, who is a recent graduate of Nantian Institute, where she completed the Masters of Arts in Applied Buddhist Studies in an MA research pro project titled Contemporary Buddha Buddhist Response to Gender Violence and Gender Inequity. Prior to her studies, Jane worked as a policy analyst in the areas of Indigenous relations, intergovernment affairs and domestic and family violence. And she's going to uh, tell us about, uh, talk about Don't Lose Your Bodhisattva, Compassionate Responses to Gender Violence. Uh, Jane. Thank you, Rod, um, and thank you everyone for um, participating today. Um, and also, I guess what I'm trying to do with my presentation is, um, you know, we heard from Dr. Sue a, a, a scenario of, of compassion in action, and then from Ian, we've got the broader sphere, but I'm looking at something a little bit closer to home to some of us Buddhist practitioners, um, and that is um, gender violence uh, in, um, in Western South on this specifically Western Buddhist communities. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that the issue that I'm talking about is prevalent across many communities and countries and societies. And so um, I do want to also acknowledge that um, gender violence is, is beyond just sexual and physical violence and that there are many forms uh, and they occur in many social spheres, including the family, um, intimate partner uh, relations, as well as um, politically and in specific communities. And so I do want to acknowledge that there might be those in the audience today or have participated in this symposium in any way um, who have experienced or witnessed uh, a form of gender violence. Um, and so I want to take this time to please invite um, you to have compassion for yourself 
um, throughout my presentation to, to take time to um, show self-compassion and to take care. Uh, and I put up some resources uh, that I hope might be beneficial to you, um, ensuring to help you ensure um, that you feel safe and well throughout this presentation. Um, and then, of course, I do want to acknowledge that um, this research uh, that I'll be sharing with you today wouldn't be possible without um, the individuals from Buddhist communities who've come forward and shared their personal experiences. Um, and then finally, I want to thank Nancy Yen for hosting the symposium um, and for giving space to many of the important issues that uh, we've been discussing over this weekend. Um, so as some of you might be aware, uh, there's been a lot of um, public controversy around certain incidences um, and allegations of, uh, of gender violence, particularly um, sexual violence, but also uh, issues like abuse of power, um, alcoholism. Um, a lot of these, uh, all, these three individuals, I think, are the more kind of recent pieces in the last few years that you may have seen popped up um, in international headlines. Um, but it's important to remember that um, these, I guess, so-called sex scandals um, have been occurring in um, various sanghas throughout the West um, in, in some form and another for a few decades now. Um, and I think the important thing to recognize in, in these patterns as they're emerging is that um, often the perpetrator, the accused, holds uh, a significant level of religious power, um, either as leaders or senior teachers, masters, gurus, um, and the like, or um, or the and they are, are part of also um, global Buddhist organizations. So they have influenced over um, a broad range of practitioners um, that are both monastic and uh, lay. And so I think it's also important that again we situate um, this this presentation, but also this discussion, this larger debate around gender violence in Western Buddhism uh, within survivors' accounts. And we know that um, it's actually not just the sexual or physical or psychological abuse that's um, that's particularly traumatic, but it's also the fact that their trust in the Dharma, that their trust in the Sangha, that their trust um, in themselves as Buddhist practitioners has been really eroded uh, through these experiences. And I guess in terms of crisis that we've been talking about, it's not just a crisis of the community, uh, or a society, but it's also a crisis for the individual. We have to keep that in mind that that collective, that intergenerational impact is what really we need to be focusing on when we're talking about gender balance in Western Buddhism. Um, so as I mentioned, there's been kind of a burgeoning public debate around this issue. Um, and Western Buddhist teachers have started to comment um, around some of the factors that may have uh, contributed to enabling gender balance in Western Buddhist Sanghas. Um, and this, of course, um, highlights gender inequality and gendered hierarchy. So to this, I mean, it's often that um, individuals who identify as male hold positions of power um, and that the abuse is targeted at individuals um, of a specific gender or sexual identity um, who are of students or you know, of, a, of a lower status than the, the hierarchy of the organization. Um, and so researchers also were adding to this debate, um, and they're increasingly interested in documenting and investigating these patterns, um, these intergenerational patterns. Um, so in particular, we are learning a lot more about how um, Buddhist and Western discourses and ideas are actually being used by leaders to perpetuate gender violence, as well as, of course, the underlying gendered systems. Um, so I think it's important here to recognize that there is sort of like an emerging research that shows that Buddhist concepts like non-duality, equanimity, right speech, um, principles that are part of Buddhist doctrine um, are actually being used alongside, integrated with Western ideas, drawing from either psychology, legal rhetoric, or neologisms, so new terms um, overall like crazy wisdom and guru devo devotion for a specific purpose, which is to silence and isolate victims um, to abscond perpetrators from any responsibility, um, as well as, of course, upholding the gendered hierarchy. Um, and again, I do want to note that this research is kind of still very emergent um, and young, um, and that there is actually another line of inquiry that um, I'm particularly interested in as a social worker and someone who has worked in the field of domestic and family violence. And that's really kind of looking more at how can we 
um, how do Buddhist discourses and Buddhist ideas actually interact with other Western discourses and ideas um, to actually support survivors and to support victims, as well as to support the healing um, of Western Buddhist sanghas and address the structural factors. Um, so that's where uh, my, my investigation, my, my research has taken off and really focuses on. And I wanted to look at um, how Western Buddhist teachers are specifically using um, discourse around uh, Buddhist discourse around compassion to develop what I would call Buddhist informed responses to gender violence in Western Buddhism. And so this is actually, as, as Dr. Uh, Professor Vickers mentioned, a part of my um, MA research that I was con that I conducted in Nancyan. Um, and I do actually want to thank Dr. Nadine, Nadine Levy, who's also part of the VEN panel, um, who was my supervisor for this project. Um, and so I'm going to be selective with the, the findings I present to you today. And I just wanted to highlight the five teachers that spoke most directly to compassion in terms of applying that um, and to respond to gender violence in Western discourse or, or Western Buddhism, excuse me. Um, so these are left to right, Lama Saltran Alion, Lama Rod Owens, Lama Justin Von Boudros, Ethan Nietzsche and Roshi Joan Halifax. And all five of these teachers are established uh, teachers. They have, um, they are teaching in sanghas. Um, some of them have founded their own sanghas like Roshi and Lama, uh, Lama Saltran. Um, and they are, most of them actually, um, from the Vajrayana tradition, affiliated with the Vajrayana tradition, um, except for Roshi Joan Halifax. So I think that's a, there's an interesting point in there. Um, and of course, I just want to make note that the, um, the resources I use were both from online as well as print publications from these teachers. And so um, there's three themes overall that kind of emerged in my research about how Western teachers and apply and interpret compassion uh, to addressing gender violence, specifically in Western Buddhism. Um, so the first theme centers around compassion ethical action. Um, and as Ian highlighted, action is part of uh, the, the framework to compassion. Um, and so again, of course, it's being underlined by Western teachers as well. Uh, and so here, they also add to that, um, that action component, this, this focus on collectivity um, and that the intention of the compassionate action, action is to reduce collective suffering for community, for society. Um, so this quote from Roshi jo Joan Halifax, I think really emphasizes this, both this component of action and action oriented, as well as um, focusing on the collective um, and having collective impact. Um, so a specific you know, uh, response that they, um, they have highlighted is actually about speaking out and um, speaking out about specific incidences of abuse of power or speaking out of specific in incidences of um, gendered violence. Uh, and so, for example, um, Lama Justin states that as Buddhist practitioners, we need to be, we need to take responsibility to expand Buddhist ethical systems to address um, issues like racism and patriarchy. And I think the really interesting thing here is that there's, there's starting to be that integration of Buddhist and Western discourse. So on one hand, we have a Buddhist discourse about compassion and ethics but also a, a discourse around social justice. And we see this in the quote from Lama, uh, Lama Justin, um, applying Buddhist discourse to modern day social justice issues like um, uh, sexual, sexual violence, racism, patriarchy. Um, and I think this is significant um, for two reasons. In the first instance, I think it, it really is a rationale uh, for Buddhist, contemporary Buddhist practitioners to respond to modern day crises um, with both spirituality and secularity. So looking to both sec secular and Buddhist frameworks, um, but also it, it is a call to action to always continue to um, live by the Bodhisattva vow and to put um, our ethical training as Buddhists into action. And so it says to us that we can turn to our training as Buddhists um, and that our, the ethical frameworks are established um, schemas that we can actually draw upon in order to respond to these, uh, these major issues. Um, so for example, the five precepts can inform our responses to reducing gender violence in Western Buddhism. 
Um, so the second theme uh, I want to talk about and share with you is uh, this idea about compassion, compassion facilitating an open awareness um, that allows us to actually really sit and hold uh, our uncomfortable emotions or difficult emotions like anger that actually can be really healing and facilitated um, to healing from trauma. Um, so in particular, um, I want to share the example uh, from Lama Rod Owens, who I think has a very unique story as he himself um, has witnessed his previous teacher um, be accused of gender violence and sexual abuse. And he went and confronted them, confronted him. And in this experience, he reflected that it was through compassion for himself for the experience that he was actually able to articulate the pain um, and actually use that as a catalyst to look at how he can be free from it. Um, and this reflects an idea that's prominent within um, Vajrayana philosophy that um, these emotional states, these uh, so-called difficult poisonous emotional states like anger can actually be transformative and that um, they can be transformed in to uh, wisdom. Uh, but I think we also look, if we look at other discourses being used by other teachers, um, there's a bit of a, of a Western modern twist and that's, um, and that's drawn from the feminist discourse. So if we look at the notion of fierce compassion, which is used by some teachers to discuss how um, that, uh, that compassion is empowering. Um, so Lama Sultran uh, describes fierce compassion as the capacity to protect or transform ourselves by cutting through our attachment to the ego. Um, and she, uh, she advocates for the practice of the five dakinis as a way to achieve this. Um, so the five dakinis to her embody fierce compassion um, and that it's through this practice, this personal spiritual practice, that we actually turn our anger and shame as trauma survivors uh, into tackling um, larger societal oppressive conditions like the patriarchy. Um, and so in this way, she personalizes or she politicizes personal spiritual practices, um, which I think is really reflective of a feminist standpoint, you know, personalizing or politicizing, sorry, politicizing the personal in order to, uh, to address oppressive societal conditions. Um, and I think it's also uh, really informative for us um, if, if we have encountered these experiences in our life. Uh, to practice and to recognize that um, our personal practice, uh, while we're doing it, it becomes a practice of criticizing and analyzing larger socio-cultural narratives that could be harming. Um, so challenging those um, ideas of the patriarchy, of uh, racism, of heterosexism, and the like. And I think um, what she puts forward in this idea of the practice of the five bikinis towards fierce compassion is the sense that um, we start to recognize our trauma as, as having a political potential um, and that we can actually use this, this trauma this source, as a source of healing and resilience rather than um, as a source of pathology, of, a, of just pathologizing ourselves. Um, and the final theme that I want to talk to you about uh, really con connects the teaching of open awareness, compassion, and wisdom. And so wisdom is this central idea to many Buddhist uh, traditions that refers to uh, generally the capacity to see and understand the true nature of reality and then to act in accordance with that insight. Um, and so in the context of gender violence, uh, Western teachers interpret this as being able to perceive nuances um, uh, in the, the lived experience of gender violence. So for example, we can also, we can, I'm going to return back to Lama Rod because um, he shares this really powerful um, example of how he used Shinata to really see the, the complexity of the situation. Um, and that one hand, he recognizes that the perpetrator, who's his former teacher, did change his life spiritually, um, was important for spiritual development, but that at the same time, he was harming people. And, um, and he says this quote that both are true and they are much more true together. But it's through this practice of shunata and applying shunata to this experience, he was able to continue to love my teacher and community, even though he was hurt and angry at the same time. Um, so Lama Rod's insight reflects the Western discourse of restorative justice. And so further, for those of you who might not be familiar, restorative justice is this idea that 
Um, we recognize the intergenerational trauma that certain communities, like indigenous communities, like Black, Amer Black American communities, have experienced. Um, and that um, instead of punishing people for their crimes, we actually take a step back and we look at how we can support the community just to heal. So you're looking at supporting not just the, or the victims, but also supporting the, uh, the perpetrators um, as well as the victims. Uh, and so I think this is uh, really powerful if you look at the context uh, of, of gender violence in Western sanghas, because I think it calls us to actually to be in a place of deep listening um, and to apply this wisdom so that we don't veer to either extreme, um, that we don't negate uh, survivors' experiences, um, and that we don't victim, victim blame, that we also don't unfairly condemn perpetrators, that we understand that they are, um, have, are meaningful to the community in their own way, that they have relationships uh, with other community members. Um, and so it calls us to actually find a way to work towards uh, the Sangha healing overall, and sort of, instead of focusing our responses on just the individual and the experience itself or the situation itself, um, we focus more on how to heal the community. Uh, so I just want to um, summarize uh, and that I just want, do want to close by saying we've seen um, a, a diversity of ways the Buddhist idea of compassion can be applied to addressing gender violence um, and that it does have uh, some linkages with Western ideas. Um, and again, thank you for your time. I'm going to put these resources back up in case anything has uh, come up for you in my presentation. That's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane. A very uh, a tough topic there um, that you've uh, articulated uh, very well. So uh, that makes it uh, very hard for Nadine. You've got a lot of good talks to top there, uh, Nadine, uh, who has our next speaker. Um, Nadine, uh, Dr. Levy holds a PhD in sociology and honours degree in both law and gender studies. Her research investigates women's lived experience across a range of social sites, including health, therapeutic landscapes and spiritual movements. And she's going to talk to us about uh, compassionate pedagogy in health and social education. Uh, Nadine. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Good. Perfect. So um, in the spirit of compassionate pedagogy, I would invite you all to receive this talk with not only your ears, but also your hearts and your bodies. I haven't got a visual aid today, so if you'd like to close your eyes and receive the words as music rather than content, you're very welcome to. So my topic today relates to compassionate pedagogy in the classroom, and it really centres on this question, what does it mean to teach with heart? This is a question that's been alive for me for some time, both as a student and now as a teacher in mindfulness and in Buddhist higher education. And I can trace my interest in this question back to when I was a high school student, following a troubling period at a very under-resourced primary school. I was enrolled in a progressive public or girls school. And there to everyone's surprise, including my own, I transformed from a very mediocre student with poor self-esteem and average grades to a student who enjoyed learning and who was developing a budding interest in justice and hope for a decent future. When I asked myself what led to this significant change in my own trajectory, the answer is quite simple. The love and attention I was lucky enough to receive from my new teachers. These were teachers who were kind and compassionate, teachers who embraced who I was, every new and wild iteration of it. These were teachers who bore witness to the ups and downs of teenagehood with a steady and present gaze, a gaze that eventually became part of me and how I teach. I can recall going to class without shoes some days, reading books by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in maths class, and developing such a love of theatre that I would sleep on the stage in the Performing Arts Centre between classes. And through all these strange moments of experimentation, my often bemused teachers, teachers offered a reliable presence and never once doubted my capacity for growth and kindness. Several years later, I found myself in the law school as an excited and complex 19-year-old keen to carve out a life path of my own 
And while I enjoyed the intellectual challenge thoroughly, I can remember the experience of being in a completely different environment, a sterile environment. I was reduced to a number. Lecturers rarely remembered my name, let alone anything about why I was taking the course in the first place. Bureaucratic processes at every turn, and quite often when I reached out to academics, I was met with a deafening silence. Determined to complete my studies regardless, I found refuge in law books and rarely spend any of my time at the university, but rather in other spaces. Soon after I completed my degree, I enrolled in a gender studies course, and ultimately this led me to feminist sociology, a discipline I was drawn to because of its commitment to social justice and an ethic of care. There I was reminded of my high school years and I found refuge. I had the experience of being seen and appreciated mainly through the nurturing care of my lecturers and supervisors and with time I began to see myself through their eyes. A few years later, I'm here at the Nantian Institute, enjoying the tremendous privilege of teaching what I love most, compassion, awareness, and contemplation through an embodied scholarly lens. Following the completion of a recent course that I lectured in and taught, I received survey results from one of my students. This student responded that one of the main things she enjoyed about my teaching was that I called her by her name. Initially, I think this is quite strange, but with time and reflection, I come to see its broader meaning, which is the basis of this paper. What I'm proposing today is that it's a teacher's capacity to see a student as a fellow human with a name and a history who is at once vulnerable, full of agency, complex and budding with potential. I would argue this is the centre of a transformative pedagogy this approach, however, must be coupled with a certain criticality that invites both students and teachers to analyse their own positionality in the classroom, as well as deep reflection upon the ways we experience, relate to and act upon what, what we might call self and other. In this paper, I draw on the new area of scholarship entitled sorry, Compassionate Pedagogy, which has links to contemplative pedagogy and critical pedagogy with an attempt to apply it to our approach here at Nantien in teaching and learning in the health and social wellbeing program. The frame of compassionate pedagogy is particularly fitting here because in Buddhist higher education and at the Nantien Institute specifically, compassion is a core value that shapes everything we do. I use the frame of compassionate pedagogy in order to sharpen the particular pedagogical approach I received as a student, and now I'm honoured to offer students in my own classroom. And I hope this will represent an invitation to educators in this field to refine and reflect upon their own pedagogical practice. Compassionate pedagogy arises out of the field of critical studies, and it's linked to Paulo Freire's work on the pedagogy of the oppressed or a critical pedagogy, where immediate value is placed on the experience of the learner. Learning here is conceived as being discoverable through the experience of the learner. The invitation then is to place trust in the student's own life experience and capacity for critical reflection in order to advance the values of equity, justice and transformation. Freire proposes that all learners possess the capacity to become aware of the social, political, ideological, linguistic and psychological forces that make up their present experience. The process of uncovering such processes in the classroom setting, as well as analysing the ways they perpetuate or reproduce our social reality, is central to Freire's promise for freedom through education. It's within this context and background that compassionate pedagogy is practiced. In the book, The Pedagogy of Compassion at the Heart of Higher Education, Gipps and his colleagues explain that compassionate pedagogy can be seen as a countercultural response to current trends in higher education that have largely been shaped by neoliberalism, neoliberalism which values choice independence and personal achievement, often at the expense of more human values like kindness, care and connectedness. Compassionate pedagogy offers a way of creatively engaging with students within this neoliberal environment. 
Further, compassionate pedagogy invites students and educators to consider the ethical dimensions of human suffering and reflect on their own responses to social ills and injustice and other increasing trends that we're seeing in higher education like post-truth cultures. Compassion here is not seen as separate from justice, but rather is fueled by it. Some theorists in this space refer to it as compassionate justice, where both compassion and justice are seen as essential responses to human suffering. Compassionate justice as a cluster challenges the commonly held assumptions within higher education that top-down protocol and metric of assessment ensures social justice and fairness. There's no doubt that there is a place for this. However, this must be balanced by a commitment to alleviate the specific and concrete suffering of students, ensuring appropriate discretion sits within any policy for this movement of the heart. Moreover, in drawing on Buddhist wisdom when thinking about compassion here in higher education, what's being proposed is the experience of being touched by suffering and having the desire to alleviate it, but not simply responding from a place of sentimentality, but rather from a place of clear discernment, equanimity and skillful means. So within compassionate pedagogy and indeed Buddhist thought more generally, compassion and wisdom are intertwined, two sides of the same coin. Compassion in the classroom is multidirectional. It flows from teacher to student, from student to teacher, as well as between students. In this sense, the, the classroom can be seen as a field of compassion, one that is actively mediated and maintained by the authority of the teacher. Teachers in this space are also invited to recognise and impart on students a sense of our common vulnerability. This emphasis re reconciles the fact that we will at some point, all of us as humans, be subject to forces beyond our control, some of which might lead to pain and suffering. Such forces, whether social or existential or psychological, require both awareness and appropriate response. And I would argue that some of these responses at times may be political in nature, and that's entirely appropriate. Compassionate pedagogy also relies on the teacher's belief that pro-social emotions like care and compassion are available to most human beings. In fact, there's a wide body of persuasive work supporting this in evolutionary sciences as well as social history that demonstrate that by and large, we as humans are caring, feeling animals who possess empathic resonance and a desire to help others in the face of suffering. I now want to move on to some of the very specific and practical ways compassionate pedagogy is expressed in the health and social wellbeing program so as to give you a taste of our particular approach. And I should say here that within our program, each and every teacher is idiosyncratic and individual and unique and their expression of compassion in the classroom does reflect their own style and there's absolutely no problem with that. There should be space for that, in fact. I'd also like to emphasise the fact that compassionate pedagogy can and should be seen as highly practical as opposed to merely aspirational or theoretical. Its pragmatic nature is emphasised in the scholarship. In fact, in my own experience, some of the most teachable moments that happen in the classroom happen quite spontaneously within the context of a relational interaction, either between students or between instructor and teacher. And this can't be planned, it can't be planned. However, certain practical steps can be taken to make these moments more likely or more possible. In the case of teaching in health and social wellbeing, compassionate pedagogy involves a range of small steps as well as certain starting assumptions which are supported institutionally through our values at the Nantian Institute. It's a praxis that requires careful attention, reflection, refinement and responsiveness in the moment. So I'd like to give some voice to some of the starting assumptions that underpin our pedagogical approach. One of the foundational notions at the centre of this approach, um, and indeed my own personal approach to teaching, is the Buddhist concept of non-self. So the invitation for the teacher here, however, is not to subscribe to a certain doctrinal philosophy, um, though many of us do, but rather to critically reflect on their own formations pertaining to self and other as an ontological starting point. 
So in my own teaching praxis, this involves noticing how I construct myself in relation to others and also whether I'm willing to move toward the other with greater intimacy and receptivity, to let go of notions of inside and outside and let students into my heart and allow the power position of teacher to drop away. Personally, this requires some contemplative practice on my own part before I enter the class, as well as starting most classes um, with some sacred silence, some moments of reflection. This I'd suggest has the potential to encourage a receptive awareness in the face of suffering. So in other words, teachers engaging in such reflections like that of non-self or compassion are less likely to be bounded and cut off from the emotions and experiences of those in the room. And this interruption of self and other in the teaching space also allows a teacher to be able to see past themselves as an authority figure or expert and put effort into sensing the needs and feelings of the less powerful other. And in this case, this is the student. That's not to say teachers should let go of all boundaries, but rather consciously choose the boundaries that best serve the setting. And from a Buddhist perspective, the spiritual generosity of compassion, which involves offering time, help and kindness, represents this same motion, which in turn leads to a kind of self-overcoming that I would argue enhances one's own life. The next aspect of compassionate pedagogy is the explicit invitation to allow suffering and emotions into the teaching space. However, this isn't done therapeutically, nor is it done uncritically. Rather, students are offered a range of activities like timed personal check-ins, time for reflective writing and mindfulness and exercises that allow them to connect with their own bodily and emotional realities. The insights that arise from these practices then can be analysed critically as a group. And as a social scientist, I use sociological theories of emotions um, and notions of social emotions and emotional ideologies to make sense of the reactions that are coming up in the teaching space. I also use mindfulness to connect students with a felt sense of their experience. So broadly speaking, the invitation for the instructor is to make clear that suffering, whether personal or political, is a valid object of academic inquiry and it's very welcome here. Compassionate pedagogy here, though, isn't moralistic. It doesn't prescribe a certain course of action or a certain reaction. Rather, it's based in investigation and intimacy with difficult parts of our life with a view of opening up unexpected and creative possibilities. And it acknowledges that each individual's response to suffering will be unique and sometimes it will be surprising. So it follows here that it's not about teaching students normatively what's right or wrong or what's good or bad, but rather allowing space for creative responses to come to the fore. And one way of cultivating this is through the instructor actively creating this compassionate field of inquiry. In my own teaching practice, I enjoy imagining a circle of connection and communion while I'm in the classroom, allowing for unexpected things to arise and the capacity to work with them pedagogically. However, I should caution that it's the instructor's experience and knowledge that's really crucial here and it's crucial that the instructor uses her intuition and sensitivity to name moments where compassion is morphing into something unwholesome like pity, victimhood or sentimentality. The instructor may be able to see such moments with sensitive inquiry and attempt to broaden their field of awareness and ground students in the present if things are going too much in an unwholesome direction. Another very important practical aspect of our approach to compassionate pedagogy is the practice of heartfelt listening, which we've heard a lot about at this conference. Students are invited to practice noticing and witnessing another's suffering with their attention, suspending judgment and watching their own reactions unfold in real time. Dyads, talking circles and the notion of listening with the ears of the heart are tools that I use in the classroom to enhance this aspect. Now, returning to the comment from my student that I used her name in the teaching space, 
I can now see after reflecting that there's a lot sitting behind a name, a cultural and social history, emotions, suffering, and tremendous capacity for creativity and inquiry. And I can only hope that I saw some of this in her as well and that she saw that in herself as a result of being in the classroom. The pedagogy of compassion that I have described today has two main dimensions. First, it's critical in that it aims to transform students, educators and institutions with the power of reflexivity and critical engagement. And second, strategic and practical in that it looks to create immediate openings that encourage the non-prescriptive, non-moralistic and spontaneous experience of giving and receiving compassion, thus not excluding any dimension of human experience in the classroom. So thank you for your time and attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nadine, as a uh, uh, administrator at Nanteen, if you like. It's a few challenges you've thrown up to me here, um, which is we are all struggling with, uh, but that's uh, terrific. It's good to be challenged. Um, so we have uh, some questions coming through um, on the chat, uh, which is terrific. Please keep them coming. Um, I might uh, start with a few for Ian. So I might start with Ian. Um, so uh, the, from Marjorie Perino, and it says, why can worldly altruistic growthism, which is a way eased human ex existence, uh, which is in a way has eased human existence, be at the same time so dehumanizing? And how can humanistic Buddhism, in your view, address this matter? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Rod. Thank you for that question. Um, hi to everyone in the Philippines. Uh, I think Major is from the Philippines. So, okay, what is what is it about uh, this worldly growth as paradigm that's so dehumanizing? Well, in the first place, it conceals what it's doing. It doesn't tell you that it's borrowing from the future. So it is deceptive. I'd say that's one uh, chronic problem with uh, worldly altruism at present. As for what humanistic Buddhism can do, so one uh, contrasting paradigm of compassion is that of, uh, you know, thinking of the benefit of beings beyond their individual existence. So in worldly compassion, uh, worldly altruism, for instance, we have. Uh, the possibility of overpopulation, whereas in great compassion, we would have to consider the consequences, all of them, of a particular act of compassion. So I suppose the question for uh, humanistic or engaged or contemporary Buddhists is, what is your position on karma and rebirth? You know, how far are you willing to go with your compassion? Uh, if, if your compassion only uh, extends to people in a single existence, then what makes it different from worldly paradigms? Okay, so rather than give you an answer, I've just given you another question. I hope that'll do. Thanks, Ian. Uh, question now for Sue from Previn. Uh, when considering healthy relationships uh, of police, was this considered in the context of the workplace, outside the workplace, or both? When engaging leadership of the organization, was there any tension discussing mindfulness-based practice and existing legislative framework around workplace and, self and safety or workers' compensation? Sue. Thanks, Pravin, for the question. So the strongest risk for converting psychological injury to PTSD in police is to have a, a, relation, a poor relationship or relationship struggles or conflict in their primary personal relationship because you can't not cope at work and then go home and not cope there as well. So a lot of the focus is on uh, the relationships outside of work and the importance of maintaining those. But the literature is showing that the most important person in the police precinct for showing compassion to the frontline officers is the sergeant. And so it was necessary to draw the sergeant's attention for the need for them to be the holders of compassion and uh, thoughts of well-being and, and uh, destigmatization in the workplace. So different, different approaches to different relationships. 
And there is a really uh, emerging body of evidence now about the use of mindfulness in policing, and there's even a, a mindfulness-based approach that's been written specifically for policing that's in early testing. And so when we've got a, a bit of an evidence base forming, we can bring it in with existing uh, legislative frameworks. It's not too much of a problem, but we just do need the evidence to do that, and it's, it's starting to happen. So thank you for that question. Okay, we have from another one, uh, one from Jonathan Page, and it doesn't specifically ask anybody, but I'll put it out to the panel as a whole so you can answer it. Uh, Thupten Jinpa describes the generative energy that arises from and maintains deep compassion. Have you experienced this important phenomenon and how would you teach it to others? Anybody would like to take that in the panel? All gone silent. I'm happy to answer that if you'd like. Yes. Um, Jonathan, yeah, uh, look, I teach a course on compassion specifically. So um, we're able to look at some of these ideas um, and reflect on them. And uh, yes, I have experienced it. It's definitely a buoying state. I feel very um, energized, I think, when I'm experiencing compassion. And for students, I think the invitation is to think about the differences between compassion, empathy, pity, um, and other, I suppose, close, connected concepts, not that they're distinguishable completely. There are some overlaps, of course, but one of the main things we do is to teach them that there's a difference between empathic distress and over-identifying with someone suffering versus being moved to try and help alleviate suffering and we work with this notion of whether compassion is a noun or a verb or both um, and so I think that's quite helpful in um, shedding light on the energizing and positive aspects of compassion. If I could just address that from a perspective as well we use the explanations from science about the social uh, hormone oxytocin and we encapsulate the energy of compassion in the way that oxy oxytocin is raised and is shared amongst teams and within, within actions and activities. And so the benefits of explaining that uh, make it uh, quite easy to teach it to others. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those responses. Uh, Previn's got another question, for, uh, this time for Jane. Uh, it may have been covered in, in the talk, but could you please outline how violence is de defined from your study? Jane. For that, um, Praveen. So um, I think the key terminology that I used was gender violence. So as I mentioned, there are many different kind of experiences of, um, of, of violence. Um, but I think the important thing when you're looking at gender violence is that they experience all those different forms, sexual violence, political violence, um, physical violence, emotional violence within a paradigm or, or framework of their gender is the, the ultimate um, common denominator. So either for their gender identity or their uh, position in a gender hierarchy, for example, you know, they could be considered um, a student as opposed to being a teacher. Um, these are, these are the, the factors that I considered when I define gender violence. Um, so it's a really great question because it is uh, heavily debated in the literature. Um, about how do we use this definition when we're studying it? Um, because of course, um, the, the phenomenon itself is so diverse um, because it's so individual, um, but there are certain patterns that we can see um, so sociologically and culturally. Thanks, Jane. Uh, another one for uh, Nadine from Dr. Kwong Chan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levy. I can see a lot of similarity in your presentation between compassionate pedagogy and contemplative pedagogy. Can you briefly elaborate more on the difference between compassionate pedagogy and contemplative pedagogy? Yeah, sure. There are a lot of overlaps, that's for sure. Um, I think the main difference is the fact that compassionate pedagogy at this stage in, in the piece is grounded in critical studies. So um, a lot of people don't like the term political. I know that some people um, shy away from the notion of political transformation, particularly in contemplative fields, but compassionate pedagogy 
invites us to consider political responses to social issues and to politicise emotions, which is kind of radical. So rather than thinking that our emotions and our sense of um, uh, suffering is a, an individual experience, we think of it in relation to broader social forces and we analyse these social forces we also see um, compassionate responses as necessarily political in that, um, you know, when you advocate for one person, it's going to affect another. And we can't kind of take ourselves out of social structures. We're really embedded and living through social structures. So um, most responses that we kind of grapple with in this kind of critical, compassionate field are um, political in some way. And I don't mean political with a, a big kind of like party politics P, I mean little P in that we, um, the personal is political as James put it. So we are kind of sitting within these broader social forces and embedded within them. So that's how I'd answer the question. Thanks, Nadine. Um, a question for Sue by Saitan. What is the next step of the program? Is there any plan to expand it to other groups uh, working in a high stress environment? Well, thank you for the question. We will be expanding it initially uh, more comprehensively through police and hopefully we can roll it out to other groups such as healthcare workers. Uh, it's a fairly generic type of program. So there's plenty of potential for it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sue. Question again for uh, Ian. Uh, Pravin uh, says, uh, do we need to necessarily see compassion or mega compassion through a karmic paradigm in order to practice it? Is compassion always seen as volitional, that is, arise spontaneously? How do we reconcile the need for corporate slash institutional cells with individual practice? Uh, multiple questions there. Ian? Okay. Compassion always requires effort. Uh, and in fact, throughout the symposium, some participants have given the sense that compassion should be almost automatic, whereas it, it in fact always needs some kind of uh, mental work on your part. Uh, if not, you don't develop your consciousness and you're unable to propel yourself towards awakening. This is the traditional idea. I suppose uh, Praveen's question is getting at, you know, do we have free will or is it all just determined? Well, you know, <laughs> those are really separate questions, I guess, in Buddhism. But uh, uh, the idea, though, is that you have control over your own mind and body. This is your tool. This is your asset. And without it, if you don't have that control, you can't get yourself to awakening. So free will is very much part of the, the thinking of Buddhism. Uh, as for how to put compassion into practice at the institution level, well, I think here I, I might have to defer to my colleagues uh, because they are, their compassion is, for my colleagues, more central to their professional practice. Uh, and I think that's all I should say there. Good, thanks, Ian. One final question here from Elaine, again for Ian. It's sort of the flip side of that question maybe is, how, how can we use compassion in our daily self slash life? Well, again, I'm, I'm not sure that I can uh, speak with more authority than my colleagues who are applying compassion in, in the classroom and in uh, continuing professional development uh, and in their social work practices. So this is, these are the, the experts, and I would really invite them to say something about this. Uh, in addition to what's already been said. Okay, may, maybe others can reply. An opening for you. Jane, I think. Yeah, I'll just stop in there around the institutional um, responses bit because there's a, there's a very interesting case study in um, Los Angeles, the Zen Center of Los Angeles, who had in their past a history of, and they had experienced this, uh, of experiencing sexual abuse, um, of allegations of alcoholism and all that perpetrated by their founder. Um, and they had such a unique response, and it's actually, I think, a, a wonderful case study in that, on the one hand, um, the former abbot, she started introducing these everyday uh, practices as part of their, their sangha practice. So they had council press practice where they actually sat down in groups 
and they were just there vulnerably with each other. They, they were there to practice deep listening. Um, they were there to be with each other, uh, both as individuals, but also spiritually. And then from there, she also developed um, something called uh, the Sangha Sutra, which um, if you go on their website, it's, it's available, but it's basically like a, a guidebook to a, a vision of what a safe Sangha looks like. So I think there are ways institutionally and that merge both sort of the Buddhist practice, but as well as working within, um, I guess, more Western paradigms of organizational uh, frameworks that we can be able to institutionally, I guess, integrate compassion into um, an organization or into a, a, a body. It's like Ian said, you know, you have to create conducive, compassion conducive environments. And I, I thank him for that framework. Thanks, Jane. Look, there's a couple of uh, qu extra questions in the chat I've noticed, but we're actually running out of time here. So I might just call it a day, but thank you for those questions. I think they're good questions as well. Um, certainly it's been a, a very challenging presentation for my colleagues here. I've put a lot more insight into their thinking and uh, I think it's been great. Um, but we do, uh, it's just two o'clock. We've got to prepare for the uh, final ceremony at 2.30. So I might just cut it there. But thank you. Hopefully we'll see you all at the uh, closing ceremony.